Irish Metal Podcast. This is Chris. And in this episode, I speak to Emil Wagner, who leads the tooling and developer tools team for a new blockchain project called Eternity. In it, we discuss making uh, blockchain projects usable for developers and fundamentally end users too, and the suite of applications they're looking to you create to make the Eternity blockchain usable. Enjoy. Okay, so um, currently in the whole Eternity project, so we are trying to build a new blockchain um, as an infrastructure to run decentralized apps. And within this project, um, I'm leading the team who is creating uh, all the infrastructure around the core technology of the blockchain. So we're not creating the blockchain itself, but we're creating the developer tools that people need to actually make use of it. And also for like a couple of consumer facing apps, like a wallet and an app browser and things that basically is the basics so that people have something uh, with the launch of the of the blockchain that they can actually make use of it um so we if we want to have them one sentence we often say we, we try to make this uh, technology more accessible that's that's our job and push create the stuff that is necessary for adoption and what what prompted the project to begin in the first place? What problem were you trying to solve of your own or one that you had heard of from other people? Yeah, so, I mean, here in the apps team, I mean, one one uh, one thing that we want to solve is or that we're looking is what do we need to do and need to develop to, um, like, make the use of decentralized applications that this could be something to be part of our daily life for everyone. And where is the obstacles here that we, um, and where are the challenges that we have to solve? And um, that is what we are trying to do here. And of course, we are relying also on the other side, the infrastructure of the blockchain that's built. It's also aiming for that, um, yeah, to be a platform that is accessible. So just to just to clarify there, because um, I just want to understand, um, mm. you're not creating your own blockchain or you will eventually or no yes in eternity we are creating our own blockchain okay. it's a new blockchain protocol it's just not my that my team is not right. working okay. on the blockchain itself we are working on the application layer on top of the blockchain which means like we are writing the documentation for developers how to use this blockchain we build tools for developers um that helps them to use blockchain like software development kits a minimal wallet to show how to implement a wallet for the blockchain but also an app browser for users that they can make actually use of decentralized apps so we are basically building infrastructure around the blockchain okay there's a couple of things there you said i'd like to get into in a bit more but Mm -hmm. um before we go there are you able to talk about the blockchain side as well or I mean, I have... Uh, At least in, in I would high say level. I, I'm not a specialist within this yeah. project to talk about that, but I'll try to answer your questions as best as I can. And if I have the feeling sure. I can't, well, then I can also <laughs> like... Uh, I think just more like in your in your mind, what, what do you think is, is, is different about your blockchain and um, how does it compare to some of the other well-known ones out there? Yeah, so I think um, so. We see like the the whole space. I mean, it is very interesting um, with this blockchain technology and this idea of decentralization. That um, before you had this trust in, in central authorities, and now you replace it with a um, like a technical infrastructure that. Um, works without the central authorities and then like with the with the second generations of chains you were able to also um not only have this decentralized infrastructure that can store something of value something like it, but you can also run um have kind of contracts there and make make that but it turned out that actually um once you shift your trust into this technical system that uh, what kind of trust, but it is really important that your the code you're writing here is really behaving in the way as you intended, right? And um, so, and there are a couple of 
you know, challenges we saw with, with current implementation that we want to address. And of course, one is uh, scalability, that this does not only work for a small group of people, but also as a really as a big infrastructure that is scalable enough to uh, work for everyone. And another thing is also, as I said, that you want really your code to behave as intended. So that means there are several things you can do. Like one is like to remove the complexity of smart, uh, smart contracts. So that's why we have an eternity on the blockchain itself. A lot of features already on the protocol level on the blockchain itself. Like a naming system, we have oracles there, but we also have scalability solutions like um, state channels and things like that. So they can make use of all these features and you don't have to implement them. Okay. I'd actually like to go to a few of these piece by piece. Let's let's focus first on your kind of area, the the D apps, um, and just for anybody who's not entirely sure what that means, that's distributed apps, <laughs> and it's become a, a popular short term yeah. already. Um, you mentioned a couple there. So, say for example, the wallet will that only run? on your blockchain or also run on other blockchains? No, I mean, of course, we start with, with our blockchain, with the Eternity blockchain. Mm -hmm. And um, currently, we don't have specific plans to support other chains. But if we see that that would increase uh, usability at some point. Mm. Uh, but is... Uh, so I, I'm guessing I, I sort of maybe forgive my ignorance or just trying to, to get into the detail... The wallet, what will it support if it's just running on your blockchain? Is it tokens and coins from other applications running on your blockchain? Or Yes. So, okay. the, the, I mean, um, so since we're creating the wallet at the same time, as we are also still developing the, the blockchain itself, um, the things that are going back and forth, but there will be um, at some point, of course, uh, um, a solution to have child tokens and they will be also supported by the wallet. Yeah. So I yeah. can just tell you exactly now when this will be the case. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the, the common phrase of many blockchain companies, but yes. <laughs> but of course this, this will question. be there. It's a quite essential feature, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um so you it looks like you're offering the choice of two consensus algorithms as well um two of the more common ones proof of work and proof of stake um won't go into too much detail of those i mean they've been spoken about in good detail by many other people so i think mm. just to mention it as an option maybe um i've kind of spoken with a few projects that uh are doing similar things but maybe if we could just in your words explain what you mean by state channels yeah. Okay. So, I mean, state channels. I have like, um, there are actually kind of two ways of state channels, or two ways you can think of. One are more like working as a payment channel, which mm -hmm. is um, it's like an easy explanation. So, both of us, we agree on to put like on chain, we put the deficit in a channel, mm -hmm. and then within. Um, this is a transaction written on the chain. And from then on, we can do transactions with, with each other in real time mm -hmm. up to that deposit and uh, to the amount that we once kind of blocked. Okay. And once we're done, um, we make another, uh, we can close this channel that is, again, an on-chain transaction. But that's it. That are the only two transactions you need to have uh, on chain. And in between, we can uh, make as many transactions in between us as we want up to the amount that we deposit into the state channel in the beginning. And I mean, that gives you like several advantages. Once one use case is to use it for uh, as a kind of a risk management. Mm. So for example, let's imagine I want to rent a car and instead of um, um, so right now you would probably block a certain amount of your credit card. In this case, you could just deposit a certain amount on the channel. So you, um, um, show that you have the, uh, yeah, that you have enough funds for that. 
and then I could be charged by every kilometer I'm driving this car, for example. There could be real-time transaction. Okay. And there's a more complicated version where you can even run smart contracts within this channel. And there then you both agree basically to the contract. And then um, one can also, um, if the other party is refusing to sign a certain state, then the other party can uh, escalate this contract onto the chain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That gives you more, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, it that's was basically a kind what, of understandable. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I, I, I always ask you a leading question because okay. I, I know what they are, but <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> just, I just wanted to clarify that it's all the same. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's also one other um, use case that um, we didn't design uh, the channels with that in mind, but um, it's actually actually another use case that is also quite interesting to look at into in the future. And that is once. Um, you open a, a channel on the chain between two parties. These parties don't need anymore an internet connection to do these mm, transactions. Mm. Only these parties have to meet physically. They could also do that in QR codes. And that is a very interesting use case for uh, regions where you don't have um, always electricity or always an internet connection. Yeah, no, for sure. You'll be able. That's actually a very good point. I mean, often uh, mm -hmm. the state channels are spoken about in the context of scalability, but it's yeah. also almost like a solution to the the problem that early mobile apps had in that, yeah. you know, data connections, especially then, would come and go. And what did you do? Um, so actually, that's a very good point. It also solves that problem, which to make the blockchain scalable not just in terms of technology but scalable in terms of uh use case um in in other parts of the world apart from just sort of western world um yes exactly. it's actually an important aspect too so it's a very good point actually um one of the other aspects that you have that uh, i'd just like to i'd like to know a bit more on so you have um oracles this is also a, a common feature of many blockchain platforms at the moment uh, that sort of, I guess, when you have a, a, distrib a decentralized distributed system, obviously trust has to be amongst people. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes trust is easy sort of programmatically and algorithmically to prove, but other times, sometimes maybe you want <laughs> some kind of source of information to help you understand that. Um, and, and your examples list uh, election results, prices of assets, weather conditions and some other sources of information as, a, as an oracle for people to refer to. I'd actually be interested to know, like, A, where do those sources of information come from or where, where will they come from? Um, and I guess how do you decide to trust those sources as well as a network? Yeah, so that is basically um, up to the people that use okay. the, the okay. oracles okay. so to decide who they will trust. Um, so, I mean, here um, you have kind of the reputation of the one who provides this oracle. Mm -hmm. So that could be basically everyone. So um, I can say tomorrow, hey, yeah, I will create, um, I think this is an interesting data and I will register an oracle and with that I will give a promise that I will deliver this data. Yeah, uh, yeah. But that will be up to my reputation then if people trust me with that or not. Yeah. And, and are those suppliers incentivized in the same way as anybody else on the network? Yeah. I mean, if, if I provide an Oracle, I'll charge a fee for people who yeah. will query this Oracle. So, okay. So. And have you seen, I mean, not just in your use case, but even wider, have you seen any anywhere, the, the, any projects that have managed to kind of encourage like, I guess, more, 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 old school uh, providers to to be oracles like the weather channel or yahoo finance or <laughs> yeah, probably not i suppose but i, I, I think it will uh, take some time yeah, for, yeah. For, for, for these to adapt to, to this new technology and also that's fair enough going on there i and, think now, one of the right. features you have that's actually um, a little different and I've not heard of before, but sounds kind of interesting to me. And I think I get a rough idea of a sort of comparison to more older technology, but the naming system. 
Um, I mean, I guess I'm seeing it in my mind as a bit of an equivalent to something like DNS. Instead of having IP addresses, Mm -hmm. you can name entities and and everything else. Exactly. Something something helpful. Yeah. Yeah. uh, uh, yeah, That's an interesting idea, actually, and not one I've seen before. So. Yes, it, it, technically it works uh, very similar. I mean, there some things work a bit different because it's a decentralized system. But in, in general, yes. I mean, right now we, in the blockchain space, you have to deal with this very cryptic addresses, yeah. and this is really not uh, user friendly. And this is a big uh, challenge when it comes to mass adoption of blockchain technology. So um, I think it is very essential to replace this. Um, quite cryptic addresses with something like more human friendly like a name mm, mm. that's also the the intention of the naming system to have something built in the platform and built in on the protocol level so that people don't have to program solutions for that as a smart contract that makes it again um yeah okay. more complex and uh more vulnerable for bugs and no, for sure. And just you mistype one number and it goes to completely the wrong place, of course. <laughs> or maybe nowhere, probably more likely. But. Yeah. Okay, let's um, – because I can't quite see a, a comprehensive list. So let's um, let's go through some of the, the apps that your team are creating then. I found mm-hmm. a couple in your GitHub repository, but they're probably not necessarily the most um, – uh, comprehensive list, I suppose. So you mentioned the wallet. And what were some of the others that you said? So yeah, I mean, right now we we start basic. So we start with the with our base app, which is a, um, a wallet and an app browser. Mm-hmm. So basically, gives you access to the to the apps, and we also have been um, working on an integration there with an offline signing device. And maybe I can first like tell a little bit more about our approach. So when we mm-hmm. started working on this, we check like um what was the best way to approach this and for us so i mean it's just a blockchain decentralized system and one of the really magical things is that this works globally right uh, every, basically everywhere in the world and smart contracts gives you um the power to like enforce your rights mm-hmm. globally without being um dependent on the authorities uh, wherever you live. So um, that's why we decided to um, develop our applications mobile first, especially the wallet. Okay. Because yeah, said, yeah. Okay, there are way more people who have like smartphones and laptops. So yeah. That is, um, that was one consideration. And then we also looked at like how it's this whole process of key management, like mm-hmm. uh, how to mm-hmm. pick up seed phrases and these kind of things. And we saw that currently, if you want to use apps and you want to switch between desktop and mobile devices, what people do is basically like copy paste their private keys back and forth. And this is not really, when it comes to security, <laughs> a very good approach. Or they have to do a lot of transactions back and forth. So we said, um, okay, let's. What? How can we do this? And we make your mobile phone your central device mm. that holds all the secrets. We and then we can, from there on, you can, of course, also use your desktop computer, but it basically connects to your mobile phone and then reroutes the signing requests and um, so that the private keys never leave your one device and you don't have to copy and paste them into several devices. And yeah, it, it's, it's also like for security consideration. But- no, and I mean, this whole key aspect is is one that really needs to be solved in uh in the crypto world like you know we, we know in in kind of traditional computing it's a struggle even to get people to use good passwords so yeah. at the moment expecting people to understand key signing <laughs> is 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 we we need to find some way <laughs> of making it more more approachable to people yeah. um i'm not 100 percent sure what it is yet but uh, <laughs> but i mean I one of the advantages is is that i mean once, uh, since air, all users have already this infrastructure with mm. public and private keys and so on, mm. there's basically no need for any other application to use to ask for a password or define a password. People can just yeah. find with their keys uh, the login and, and stuff like that. So, in the future, I hope 
it will become a bit more easy. It, it, but, it's, uh, it's, but you're right. Strangely, strangely, you you may be helped by companies like Google possibly <laughs> doing that even before the crypto world does, <laughs> and then hope, and then maybe we can leverage that. Um, like they, they've talked quite endlessly about wanting to have everything password free very yeah. soon, um, and I think the latest Chrome browser you can now use fingerprint readers in the browser. Um, yes, they're they're, like they're yeah. a couple of technologies, and we will see if we can yeah. like how we can integrate something like that or connect to that or like at some points where you say that yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, I'd like to uh, I'd like to talk about the app browser, but I'd go back a step because I notice um, so you have your own. Um, scripting language based on OCaml. And this is only the second time I've heard of OCaml and I can't remember where I heard about it the first time. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think not in the crypto world. I think it might have been yeah. bizarrely a JavaScript project that was using it. Um, yeah. You have two languages, Sophia and Varna. Um, I guess the first question is um, why create your own and not use one of the pre-existing uh, mm. smart contract languages. Yeah. yeah, that was like, um, that leads back to what I said in the very beginning. So when we started on this, we were thinking about how can we design a system, like when you shift your trust into this technical system that has less space for mistakes mm. and creating a new uh, language for uh, smart contracts is one way uh, to address this problem. Um so we have the smart contract language Sophia mm-hmm. for the start. Rana will come a bit later. And um, the thing is that, I mean, also uh, for me, when I joined this project, I was like, whoa, what is that? But uh, if you think a little bit about it, it actually really makes sense. So this is a functional programming language and um, it's strongly typed. And mm-hmm. basically the, um, the idea behind is to reduce the side effect and make your code really more readable and expressive. Yeah. So um, that was like, we hope like for to reduce the code that is needed and also like um, to make sure that really this language behaves uh, um, as you want it and that there's less room for mistakes. And hopefully in the future, it will, there will be even things like that you can do like formal verification on certain properties mm-hmm. of your smart contracts and things like that. So that you have mathematical proofs that this really doesn't do anything else. Yes. That is not intended. So. And does it compile down to do something or? Yeah. So this is some, um, and the eternity blockchain itself is designed to support multiple VMs. Okay. And this is also, I mean, <laughs> Sophia is still like a two incomplete languages, but later on, Vana will be more a way more simpler language. And um, with that, but maybe not too incomplete, you can, it will be even easier to do these proofs and this kind of stuff. And this will be, since you have so many features already on the protocol, like the naming system, oracles, and so on, you don't need that kind of uh, complex smart contracts anymore. And even a very simple language like Varna should be sufficient for a lot of um, for a lot of projects. But for now, we have Sophia, and um, yeah, there you can basically do what you can also do on other smart contract uh, platforms. Um, but it, uh, yes, and what um, I mean, as I say, Sophia is based on OCaml, which is not massively familiar, and Varna <laughs> no. is described as being simpler. But just, I guess, I guess you're still in the early stages. But um, what what programming languages that people might be using might be helpful? <laughs> How, yeah, what will okay. be familiar? Yeah, will they be I, think, familiar to? I think it is like if you're used to uh, functional programming, okay. language, it sounds like Haskell, maybe. Yeah, uh, then you definitely have an. Uh, it's it's way easier for you. I to did adapt. notice that your. I just find the page now. I did notice <laughs> that your team has a lot of uh 
What was it? A lot of Erlang programmers, yeah. Oh, yeah. So basically, <laughs> the, the whole core blockchain developers, the blockchain itself is developed in Erlang. Mm. So, they, of course, they're very familiar with this functional programming paradigm. And, yeah. um, and actually, on that note, you have a relatively large team. So... I'm assuming that you went through an ICO or something, or I mean, what's the history of the the company? Briefly, of course. <laughs> um, so there was no ICO, but there was a contribution campaign yeah. in uh, April last year. That was uh, before I joined the project, so I okay. can't tell you so much about. Okay, fair enough, and. I'd also just like to, now we've talked about how people might create um, the apps. You mentioned the um, the app store. Um, how I, I can see you have a, a sort of a screenshot right at the top of the web page about how that, that may look. Um, well, I think this is more after someone has already installed some, but do you envisage this looking like more traditional app stores or do you have a different idea for it? Yeah, I mean, uh, in the beginning, well, you can basically create your um, your apps as a web app, and it will. Um, so our wallet is kind of a browser, except of in, inserts and other layers that allows your app to communicate with the wallet. So you okay. technology-wise, your app is a web app, and you you talk, but with the with a post message interface to talk to uh, talk to our wallet and. Um, for signing requests and things like that. And in the beginning, of course, people can also create their their own apps and uh, deploy them to the app stores as they want, and, but then they have to um, do a bit more on, on their own and uh, can use less of the infrastructure that we provide, but that's of course. Okay. And now here comes the, the, the difficult question. Um, like what you're offering, I've seen elements of in um, in Lisk. In um, I'm now having a complete blank. <laughs> there's there's mm-hmm. another Berlin company that claims to be the the mobile OS for for blockchain. I'm having an absolute blank on on the name. Uh, oh dear. Anyway, maybe I'll just summarize the question with sort of how, how, how do you think you compare to some of the other projects working on similar ideas? Okay, yeah, I, I mean, there are, of course, um, other projects having similar goals in mind. Still, I think the way um, how, how to do that is, is when for eternity is quite different than for, for other projects. And... Um, so to have the system like creating a, a new blockchain on one hand, but also like uh, new tools on the on the application layer to make it easy for people to develop and safe, which is also secure, which is easy. And I think also with with all these features that are already integrated mm. in the core blockchain technology, I didn't, I haven't seen that so far. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that that will be. Uh, really um a really good project in the end okay and really help people to build more and better decentralized apps and i think just one final question around this because it's something i've noticed a lot which is a, a positive and um you mentioned it yourself several times um this whole aspect of it's been a very positive trend in the space in that um suddenly everyone is realizing that you can't just make cool technology you have to actually make it understandable as well <laughs> and there's been a very big focus i've noticed on um you, the the developer experience on making sure there's documentation etc cetera, etc cetera. so i mean at least in your your small part of the team that you manage how important is that to you oh this is so very important i mean especially since we are working on this yeah. application layer um, as one of the key things that, that we are working on how to create better documentation and currently we're still also developing at the same time right mm-hmm. so the underlying technology is changing uh, we're still in the process of developing the apps and still we already document a lot of stuff also will change and um, yeah 
that is like it's one of our like uh, things i would say like uh, 40% of our time. So, <laughs> yeah. Excellent. I'm glad to hear How to make it, uh, make it more. It's not only writing documentation, but it's also of, uh, about thinking of ways how to, can we make this more accessible? Yeah. Yeah. Especially that we have, yeah. for example, this um, functional programming paradigms, which are not very uh, known out there to no, the no, for sure. web app developer, for example. And, uh, look, I mean, I, I do some of this kind of work as a, as a job and but i also know that in some respects if you make the 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 platform the language easy to understand in the first place then um the the documentation is also less <laughs> so, so, so it, it has it has a it's a, and this program language sophia it has a steep uh, learning yeah, curve yeah. you also you have a lot of benefits if you go through this progress yeah, yeah. So obviously it's still fairly early days for the product, but, um, or the, the platform, but, um, what's on the roadmap for the next six months? Yeah. So, um, the plan is to, um, to have a release candidate for the mainnet launch. And with that also, um, release, um, a couple of like the basic infrastructure to build apps on top. And from there we're, um, we're curious to see um, how and which way are people using it and then from there on also adapt to that and build more tools, build more documentation, also create more tutorials. And I think it will be from then on once the basic technology is out there, a lot about making things easier and uh, remove obstacles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to make sure people know about? No, I think uh, it's like it's a good overview. I mean, there also in the core technology, there's a lot like, um, for example, when it comes to the interactive performance of mm -hmm. a chain. So that's another usability problem, right? So uh, people are used like in online shops, you click the buy button and then uh, you don't want to wait. Or in general, mm -hmm. if you click, any button <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the usability studies that show that 100 milliseconds already a lot uh, when we use blockchain so depressing, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when we look at blockchain technology um, and talk about like the interactive performance we look at response times about like uh, we're talking about almost a minute it mm -hmm. sounds like that mm -hmm. And um, to address this challenge, we impl um, implement in the core technology, a technology is called Bitcoin NG, okay. that allows to split up big blocks and really small micro blocks and have a way faster response times. And we're talking here about block times, about three to five seconds. Okay. Okay. And that will also help app developers a lot because of the, the interactive performance of the blockchain is way better. Okay. So, yeah, it sounds like you've got a lot of interesting aspects there. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes, especially when you're just looking at a project's website, it's hard to always dig out exactly what these key differences are, um, mm -hmm. which obviously is also part of the challenge for you as well, is to make sure people understand that, <laughs> uh, especially as hopefully all these projects finally become kind of live, usable projects in the near future um, and people start making decisions about what they're going to use. You need to make sure that the the positive aspects of yours are, 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 are clear to people, I suppose. That was my interview with Emil Wagner from the Eternity Blockchain Project. If you have enjoyed the show, you can find previous episodes at gregariousmammal.com slash podcast. And you can support the show at gregariousmammal.com slash support or leaving a review wherever you consume your podcast episodes. I have been at Chris Chinch on Twitter and ChristianChiller.com on the general internet. And until next time, thank you for listening.